I wish I was that tall. What a wonderful time it is to be here today to celebrate you. This whole service today is about you, and including this service and the message. You know, when we started talking about doing this service a couple of weeks ago, uh, I told Jeremy, I said, Jeremy, you're in charge. I said, you're going to get to tell the pastor what to do. Now, he is a great man, but I did not know, church, that outside being our youth and families pastor, that he is such a great joker. I mean, he has got a great sense of humor. He actually came to me and said, Pastor, I want you to do the first part of the sermon. I said, absolutely. I'm a Southern Baptist pastor. And he said, and you need to do it in 10 minutes. (laughs) I really thought he was joking. But I've got the schedule right here, and he was not joking. It really says 10 minutes, and I just wasted one of them. (laughs) But that's okay. Okay. You know, today we're going to be talking about life's courses. Y'all are on a life course. You just finished a major accomplishment in your life. You've got to walk down the aisle. You've got a piece of paper that says you have been educated. But it is a great start, but it is not the end. You're in a life course now. And this course will have many chapters And this book will not be closed until God calls each and every one of us home. See, just like these young men and women are here, everyone sitting in this room today is still on a life course. And through these life courses, we've got to realize that there are required courses and elective courses. This morning, I have been given the honor and privilege of talking to you about the required courses. The first one is life. You didn't get a choice about it. You got life. But here's the thing, you do not get to choose where you were born, when you were born, or who your parents are. You you didn't get to choose that. God did that for you. If I got to choose as a baby in the womb where all this was going to be, I would have been born in Disney World in the 1950s. Ronald McDonald would have been my daddy, and Mrs. Butterworth would have been my mama. Because you cannot have a great life without chicken and nuggets and pancakes. But see, God had a different plan for me. Instead, I was born to Alvin Stanley Kelly. I was born to Francis Louise Kelly in Easley, South Carolina. You might not know where that is. Everybody knows where Clemson is. It's 15 miles below that. In Easley Baptist Hospital. They did not even know that they were going to have twins. They found out that day. I was the first of two. The chosen always is birth first. (laughs) The angels in heaven, the clouds parted, and you could hear, my mama says the doctor had my brother. But my daddy came out. And he wanted to see his boy. And the nurse comes and has them both. And daddy looks at his favorite son. And he says, is that with mine? And the nurse says, yes, it is. And in dad's eyes, it was just like the angels. It was, whoa. And then he said, well, who's the other baby? She goes, oh, you had twins. That one's yours too. And I went, (laughs) You know, they didn't get a choice. We didn't get a choice. Easily South Carolina. And the map of the world means nothing. You know, if we could choose to answer these questions before we're born, we would probably make different choices. But God always seems to know exactly what we need, when we need, and where we need it to be. See, if it wasn't for my mother and father, I would not be the man that I am today. If it wasn't for everywhere where I was born to be able to bring and share these stories with you in my sermons, my upbringing, what God would have me to do, I would not be able to bring these sermons. I would not be the called man if it was not for the hard times. See, God knew the life he was calling me into. I didn't know the, God, the life God was calling me into, but he knew the life. God knows the life he's calling you into. But see, you're getting to the point in your life where you're going to get to make choices. And you're going to have to make sure that they're solid choices. But we understand that even though we have life and we didn't get to choose where we were or what, who we were getting or where it was going to start, God did give us life. And he loved us so much through that life, he wanted to make sure that it was all eternal. So we sent his son, Jesus Christ, 
to ensure that all who believe would have life for all eternity. But if you have life, you've got to have death. See, death is a hard thing. Nobody wants to look at death. So when we look at the first thing being life, we move to death. And see, we understand that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22, it says, For all in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. For all in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. We're going to die. It's coming. I hope mine is a long, long ways off. Actually, I hope the rapture happens before I have to experience that. But God's already promised me and everyone in here that are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ that your last breath here will be your first breath there. So we see this that even though Adam, let's, let's think about that. Adam, is he taking a bad rap for this? You know, if they would have never ate that fruit, God knew he was going to create each and every one of us. Before time itself, we were on his mind. And he knew he was going to create us. They're in the Garden of Eden. If he knew he was going to create us, can you imagine us all being able to be in the Garden of Eden right now? There was not going to be any death. But when they took that fruit and sin was introduced, death was proclaimed. But through death, God also said, I still want you to have life. See, we can't read the first without reading the second. Also, Christ shall be made alive. If you believe in Jesus Christ in your life right now, you have been made alive. You have been made whole. You have been redempted, fine. You have been glorified. You have been sanctified. Well, what all does that mean? That, that's a lot of preachery words. That's a lot of Christian words. What are you saying? I'm being... As honest as I can be, as God sees you through his son, you have been made perfect. How does that sound? See, if you're sitting here today and you're looking at yourself and you're like, well, I don't feel perfect. God sees you as perfect because if you're saved, he sees you through his son's eyes. Each and every one of you sitting here looking at me right now, you're perfect. You're exactly the way you want or God would have you to be. And if you don't believe me, ask your parents and your grandparents. They'll say, yes, sweetheart, you're perfect. I tell my girls all the time how perfect they are, right before I tell them they can't have any more money. <laughs> Did Adam mess it up? God knew Adam was going to fail, so he already had a plan to make sure that we could succeed. Just like you're doing now. You're making sure that you succeed because you worked so hard in school. Did you have perfect grades? Maybe one or two of you, maybe all of you, maybe none of you. But look at your diploma. Each one of you, it says the same thing. You made it. Does it mean you're done? No. Some of you are going to go into the workforce. Some of you are going to go to trade school. Some of you are going to go to college. Some of you may even be my future doctor. But whatever God has in store for you, I promise you, he says, I have it more in store for you more abundantly. We just have to be willing. But knowing this, everyone must walk through the valley of shadow. In Psalms 23, 4, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Everyone in this room is going to go through shadows in the life. Some of you are looking up here, even on this front pew today. You may be going through a shadow in your life. You're wondering, is this as good as it's going to get? Am I going to be any better? Is it going to get, oh my goodness, any worse. It was all I could do just to get dressed this morning and make it on time. For those of you who made it on time, especially for the families that made it to breakfast, you got a little taste of heaven this morning, Johnny Gray's grits. That's always a piece of heaven. But you know, sometimes we hit these shadows and we're wondering if we're going to make it through, the shadows are so darkened in our life that we can't even see the light at the end of the tunnel. But see, we don't stay there. God says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. There is nothing you need to fear when you're walking with Christ. He says, for you are with me, talking about Christ. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He's saying, you will not be alone. No matter how dark it gets, when you can't see, I will be your light. When you don't know where you're at or who's around you, you will feel my touch. 
you are not alone. God said that you are mine. I love you, I protect you, and I guide you. And that's not just for these young men and women here. That's for everyone in this room. Shadows are going to come. You may have not have faced any shadows in your life right now. They're coming. But you're going to be able to face them. It's appointed for every man wants to die. In Hebrews chapter 9, 27, it says, And as it is appointed unto men wants to die, but after this, the judgment. No one in this room is going to escape a physical death. It's a required course. This body is going to decay. But here's the great thing about that. God says that I restore your soul. He says I'm going to make you a new creation. Yes, this is going to wither. Yes, it's going to get older. Yes, as you get older, I'm 47 years old. It reminds me of a cereal, snap, crackle, and pop. My knees, my elbows, my neck. I'm like, what in the world happened to you, Bart? It's only been 10 years, 20 years. Remember when you were 18? That's a shadow. I can't even see it anymore. Is death coming? It's always coming. But my spiritual life will never see the darkness of the physical death. See, God's already promised me. He's already said, I'm going to have this. You're going to do this required course. But with Christ, you're going to get an A. You don't even have to have extra credit. Which, by the way, in college, if you're thinking, if you're going, there's no such thing as extra credit. Do it right the first time. But with God, there is no extra credit. Hebrews here is very clear. Even through the appointment of the death, there will be judgment. See, the third thing is after this judgment. In the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. See, that's a wonderful thing we see there because we realize that while we're on this planet, while blood is still coursing through our veins, that we have life, and God tells us through his son here that you will be a new creation, not just when you get to heaven, but even now. You are a new creation when you accepted Christ. See, people are worried about the final judgment, and God is telling us that the first judgment that we receive is here on earth. Do we accept or do we not accept? that of Christ. We understand that when we look at this, it sounds so confusing, but we find out very early in our life here, long before eternity starts, if we're going to be with him in heaven. The choice is yours. But that is an elective. Why is it so important that we understand about this decision we make because the judgment no one will escape. See, you're sitting here this morning and you're wondering about this, but all will be judged. There's not a man, woman alive on this planet that will not face this judgment. But it is up to you to decide how you will be judged. Because there's going to come a time, and we see this in Revelation chapter 20, it's called the great white throne judgment. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. We understand that we can escape this judgment because our name has been added into the Lamb's book of life because we accepted Christ in our life. So what is so important about this? Why do we need to worry about it? You will be there. You will see those that don't make the same decision you do. The ones that you worked with, the ones that you played with, the ones that you broke bread with, your friends, your family, all that are involved, they will be there. Everyone that has ever existed will be at the great white throne judgment. You'll either be in the arena up top with your name in the Lamb's Book of Life or you will be in the pit below where there is no salvation. See, the choice now is also up to you. Will you share Christ with others the same way that you have accepted Christ with yourself? See, someone shared Christ with you. 
in this life course, the judgment, no one escapes. But they can get a reprieve. You just have to be willing to share Jesus. I encourage you today, as you move forward in your life, whether it be a trade school or college, or you're going straight into the workforce, share Christ. There's very few differences we can make in our life for others, but we can make an eternal difference if we're willing to share Jesus. This judgment the book of Revelation tells us about is final. But the way we help others see this decision in the scriptures, in the Holy Spirit, the Father above, and Jesus himself is changed here on earth. So as you learn and you go through these life courses, I encourage you to share what is already given to you. For those who are in here today who does not know Christ, I simply ask you this. You may have came in empty and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, but you can leave full and you can leave secure. Jeremy? Got to bring in the younger guns to finish. So uh, we're going we're to get it done here. So required courses. He taught with you about life and about death and about judgment. And that's nothing that any of us have control over. So I get the honor and the privilege to talk with you about elective courses. And we do get uh, some choices there. So... Graduates, I'm honored to be here and uh, talk with you this morning, family, friends, church. Uh, what a privilege it is to have such a good-looking graduating class. So proud of each and every one of them. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. An elective course, an optional study, a course that a student may select from among alternatives. And I just did a little bit of research as some of the elective courses that some of our colleges were offering. And uh, just to give us an idea, art appreciation, dance appreciation, oral interpretation, introduction to film, world religion, introduction to communication, or just to name a few. Now, whatever you choose to do in life, whatever course you're going to major in, you get to make decisions on elective courses. And in life, you're going to have a lot of elective courses a lot of elective decisions that you make because parents are not making decisions for you anymore. And you're going to have college professors who aren't going to call your parents if you miss a class or you don't show up. You're going to start having these elective decisions to make. And you have to start looking at it as freedom versus consequence. So, if you haven't already, you'll get to ask yourself, do I go to class today? That's the freedom you're going to have, but it has a consequence. You get to ask yourself, do I study today? And that's the freedom you're going to have, but it has a consequence. Will I be productive with my time today, or will I just do what's fun for right now? That's the freedom you're going to have, but it has a consequence. On Sunday mornings, you're going to wake up and not be at home, and you get to ask yourself, do I sleep in today? Or I do, I go to church today. That's the freedom you go have, but it has consequences. One of the very first elective decisions that we make, and a lot of people have already made it, is number one on the bulletin under elective courses is to be saved or to be lost. Graduates, the choice is yours. Church, the choice is yours. I found this quote and I really liked it. It says, Nature forms us, sin deforms us, school informs us, but only Jesus Christ can transform us. John 14, 6 says this, Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So graduates, all the wrong that you've done, we won't list them up here in front of everybody. Are we not going to list all the wrongs that I've done? 
are all the wrongs this church has done, are all the wrongs this community has done. The smoking, the drinking, the drugs, the murder, the lying, the adultery, and the list could go on. None of those items will send you to hell. The only thing that will send anybody to hell is to deny Jesus as Lord. The choice is yours to be saved or to be lost. You have a decision to make. If you haven't already made that decision, you're choosing to be lost. The elective decisions. Number two is to be spiritual or carnal. Romans 5, 8 says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. So to be spiritual, you set your minds on things of the Spirit. To be carnal, you set your minds on things of flesh. And that will be a struggle for you. And that will be something you have to overcome. And you might ask yourself, well, how do I know when the Spirit is leading me? Well, first, graduates, church, I would tell anybody to pray. And when you finish that prayer, pray again. And when you finish that prayer, find a prayer warrior to pray for you. And when you find them, then you pray some more. Just bathe in prayer. But the Spirit leads like that knot in your gut when you got a really big decision to make or you got a really hard conversation to have with somebody. Who knows that knot that I'm talking about that it just gets in your gut and you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do, what I'm going to say. I know what I need to do and what I need to say. A lot of times that's the Spirit leading us. When you toss and turn in bed and you can't sleep because you've wronged a friend or a family member. That's the Spirit leading us. When you walk away and you know God was leading you to pray with a person and you didn't do it. That's the Spirit that's leading us. You have elective decisions. You can be spiritual and act on the Spirit or you can be carnal and act on the flesh. That's a get of our elective decisions. Third, to be scriptural or logical. Another elective decision that you will have to make. Now, it's not a popular plan when you start making decisions to go to scripture and see what it says. But I tell you from experience, graduating class, there are a lot of decisions I wish I would have made and I would have went to this and made my decisions versus logic. Now, that leaves us with a lot of consequences based on making decisions off of logic instead of scriptural. But I can tell you that you need to use scripture to base your decisions off of. Why? Because Jesus did it. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. Graduates, church, use scripture not logic, to make your decisions. The very last point, elective decision that we tend to make. To be safe in God's will, 
or in your own will. And I think we do this a lot, not even knowing. But 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8 says this, For God gave us a spirit, not a fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. So a lot of times we tend to try to find safety in things. For example, you may get to a point where you find safety in the amount of money you have in the bank. You might find safety in the job that you have. You might find safety in your family. You might find safety in the neighborhood that you live in. You might find safety in the best and safest car or truck on the market. But what I want you to hear today, graduating class, and what I want you to hear today, church, is that the only place to be safe is, is the will of God. Because all of those things don't matter when we take our last breath. And if you don't hear anything else today, I want to leave you with a little tidbit to go with because nobody ever told me this. Regardless of what you do in life, no matter how much money you have in the bank, no matter what your career is, no matter what kind of cars you have sitting in your driveway, and no matter how many square feet your house is, no matter what your last name is, no matter where you go to church at, at the end, at the very end, when you take your last breath, and death is a required course, we don't know when that day's coming, when you take your last breath, the only thing that matters is what you did with Jesus while you were here. So, regardless of what you do in life, whether it's you feel like it's a small job or you feel like you're on top of the world, be a missionary and ask yourself every day, what can I do with Jesus today? Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for an opportunity to come and talk with these graduates as they turn this chapter in their life, Lord. And it may seem like another day, but Lord, they're uh, one step closer to being out on their own and making elective decisions. And Lord, I pray that we can be a church and a family and a friend and a pastors that um, a solid foundation that they can come back to and lean on for support and wisdom and knowledge. And Lord, we pray blessings over their life. And Lord, I just um, thank you so much for this opportunity. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. So just remember, what will you do with Jesus? Now as I close, I have a very special and honored guest. And um, I'm going to ask him to come. And he's going to have some closing remarks and close us in prayer. And uh, church, I want you to know that being a youth pastor in another uh, school district... It's an honor and a privilege to have a principal that allows a pastor to come in the school. So I want you to give him a warm welcome as we um, welcome Mr. McCormick, Farmville High School principal.
if you do that, then you will make memories for your life that are everlasting. And of course, as Jerry and Pastor Mark have so appropriately stated today, we get to spend eternity with our good Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is an honor to be here, Lord, uh, standing uh, where I don't deserve to stand, Lord. Uh, Lord, we, we're not perfect. Uh, I'm not perfect. Uh, these graduates before us are, are not perfect, but Lord, we're just so uh, grateful that, that you have that perfect salvation that we are able to uh, believe in and trust in and apply to our lives. Lord, uh, we don't know what the future holds in store for us, only you know that path that you have laid out before us. Our prayer is simple for these graduates. We pray that you would guide them, you would direct them, and you would just keep them under your watch as they face the challenges of this world. And Lord, we thank you for the victories that they are going to continue to have in their lives. We are so proud of them. Uh, Lord, we are so proud of all the accomplishments and the accolades that they have already received as graduates from their respective schools. Our prayer uh, to you is that they will press on, Lord, to do the good work that you have in store for their lives. Forgive us of our sins and really fail you. We love you, Lord. I could get Jeremy and Dana to get where they need to be. We will now present to you our 2019 graduation class. Graduates, as your name is called, please come forward. Please remain standing once you have been recognized. Lauren Aquilar, graduate of Barnwell High School. Future plans to attend Charleston Southern, area of study, biology, and pre profession Megan Barragala, graduate of USC Columbia, computer science and engineering. Mercy Barragala, graduate of Baltimore High, future plans, attend USC Columbia, area of study, computer science and engineering. Walker Burt, graduate of Baltimore High, future plans to attend Clemson University, study civil engineering. Sam Ben Solomon, graduate of Barnwell High, future plans to attend Clemson University, area of study of a pre-business. Lexi Thompson, graduate of Barnwell High, future plans to, include, uh, to attend Clemson University, area of study, environmental and natural resources. Chloe Town. Graduate of Baltimore High. Future plans or attend USC Aiken, an area of study, secondary education, science, and theater education. Jared Town, graduate of Jefferson Davis Academy. Future plans or undecided. Area of study when he decides where he will go will be graphic design. James Dakota Cody Zizit, graduate of Baltimore High. Future plans for Palmetto Training Incorporated. His area of study there will be welding. And then Abby Cosby, she's not here today. She was unable to attend. She is a graduate at USC Buford, and she will have a bachelor's in nursing and is cum laude. First Baptist Church of Barnwell, your 2019 graduates of Barnwell County. Amen. You may be seated, thank you. You're gonna get a small gift, a small token of our appreciation for you. Know that we will continue to pray for you and everyone in this room is your family and your friends. They appreciate you and we appreciate everything that you've done for this church. We know you will continue to be here and be a part of this family, but we also know that you will be called away to do other things during this course of training and learning and getting your degrees or your training and learning in your life as far as what God would have you to do. But with this being said, never forget that Jesus loves you, Jesus cares for you, and Jesus guides you.
Now, before I close this in prayer, get your phones ready, your cameras ready. I want to make sure I get out of the picture. I'm going to give you five seconds. So if you'd like to stand up where you're at and take a picture of our graduating class, 